Mute planes roar down the strip and zoom aloft at incredible speed. These are the fighters of the air fleet. Daily they go up and daily they land. From the looks of the bullet holes, some of them have made contact with the enemy. Battle scars that show that American ships are built to take plenty of punishment. World War II was in full-blown force for about two years before the United States entered in December 1941. At this time, the life of Americans was changed almost overnight. Not only was it changed for the 16 million men and women who joined into the Army, but also for those on the home front. Born in Rockford, April 4th, 1927. lived on a farm most of my life and then we moved to town when my brothers were in high school because they had no high school up there in the country. Well it was a busy downtown and our big anchor stores, uh, well it was Wisey's back then, it's Bergner's now, they were down there. Doctors offices were all downtown, dentists. Well, all the big stores they had little places, but they were all little personal stores. Everything was right downtown, and it was always busy. Anything you needed was right there in the center of Rockford. World War II had a profound impact on the United States. Although no battles occurred on the American mainland, the war affected all phases of American life. No, I don't remember anything really coming up to it. The first I knew about it was I went in the living room at my home and my father was in there listening to the radio. And I come in, he says, be quiet. And I says, why? And he says, well, we may be in war. And he had two sons that were at the right age, so. Just before 8 a.m. on December 7, 1941, hundreds of Japanese fighter planes attacked the American naval base at Pearl Harbor near Honolulu, Hawaii. The barrage lasted just two hours, but the effects were devastating. The Japanese managed to destroy nearly 20 American naval vessels, including eight battleships and almost 200 airplanes. More than 2,000 American soldiers and sailors died in the attack, and another 1,000 were wounded. The day after the assault, President Franklin D. Roosevelt asked Congress to declare war on Japan, which was approved with just one dissenting vote. Three days later, Japanese allies, Germany and Italy, also declared war on the United States. And again, Congress reciprocated. My one brother went in the service, and uh, the other brother worked on the farm, and they wouldn't let him come, go into the service because they said they need the boys on the farm. Signed into law by Franklin Roosevelt in 1940, the Selective Training and Service Act established the first peacetime draft in United States history. Under the act, all American males between 21 and 36 years of age registered for the draft. If drafted, a man served for 12 months. After the United States entered World War II, a new Selective Service Act made men between 18 and 45 liable for military service and required all men between 18 and 65 to register. The terminal point of service was extended to six months after the war. My parents weren't too happy about the one leaving, but we didn't have a telephone in those days, but uh, when he went in the service, that's something we did have, was we got a phone. It was a simple life back then. <laughs> Getting a job at Tester's Corporation was another thing Betty received due to the war. Tester's Corporation was a manufacturer of model kits, tools, and accessories. It was one of the many companies in Rockford during World War II that switched to producing materials for the war. Well, somebody from that was called, um, was an aircraft factory, came to the school and uh, let them know that they could use children, anybody who was of age that they could go to work, they could use them because they were making parts for aircraft and that. And so my friend and I decided, let's try it. And, uh, we walked from West High out to um, 11th Street and 18th Avenue, which is quite a hike, but we went to work after school. In fact, the uh, 
boss there tried to talk us into quitting school and working full time, which we didn't do, but they needed help so badly because all the men were gone. Betty and one of her high school friends were a part of the multitude of high school students hired because of the war. Almost everyone had a job after school, putting in their part to the war effort. Um, we worked in the testing of um, hose clamps, for one thing. We had to run them up on a rod as tight as we could go and see if they'd break to test them. And then we riveted parts, used riveting machines. So, that was fun. We just thought it was fun. <laughs> Helping the war effort, we thought it was nice. We could do something. And pretty soon we had quite a few working there. Everybody I knew was working somewhere after school and on weekends. We all thought we were helping out in our own way. But um, it was always a couple friends or so that we always went together. A lot out of curiosity, too, I think, just to see what the world was like, what it was doing. They used to have troop trains loaded with the soldiers. The people, men who were leaving to go, and the train ran right across, long testers, so we all hung out the windows, wishing them well. Nothing really bothered us. I mean, we may do best we could. The only thing I noticed that we, uh, I didn't like the shoes we had to wear back then. They had composition soles, not leather. And you had to kind of cut around the edges and th when they raveled. <laughs> but, uh, and of course gas was rationed and uh, we didn't have a lot of it. So nobody took vacations, didn't go places like that. And, I remember my brother smoked, and I do remember that cigarettes were hard. My mother tried to get him to send to him, and uh, Lucky Strike had a slogan back then. They were in a green and red package, but they needed the green for the, um, you know, the camouflaged ones. They needed the green dye, so they had a slogan, Lucky Strike went to war. They took the green, <laughs> had it come out in a white wrapper. Well, we just, uh, like I said, during the war, we did, couldn't travel around anywhere and use gas that we shouldn't use and retreads on the tires. We couldn't get new tires. So we stayed home or we'd walk to each other's places, houses, and uh, play cards or board games. We'd just do things like that around the house. Went to movies, you know, we could walk down to the Coronado or Midway. But other than that, there wasn't a lot going on. If you wanted to dance, you went to the USO. We go as a crowd to the USO and dance with the soldiers and stuff. And that was, we just thought that was fun. It was good. And that stayed open for quite a while. Because I went in nurses training after high school and we still went down after the war was over. American school children studied current events much more closely than before the war. Certain subjects like geography were meaningless to many children until December 7th of 1941. Soon enough, every child knew where Pearl Harbor, Midway Island, Guadalcanal, Sicily, Normandy, Okinawa, Iwo Jima, and many other places were located that they had never heard about before. Well, you had to study current events. We had a lot of that in school, and that continued. That was one of the main topics in history class. Well, my brother was in the service, and we found out a lot after he came home about things like the Battle of the Bulge when, they, when he was a pilot, a glider, and they got down. Planes couldn't get in to get them out. Told us things after he got out of the service. But we didn't know about those kind of things when we were, when it was happening. Mm -hmm. And most everybody had somebody in the service over there. And they all acted like they really were interested. They participated, you know, and talked about it. And I think that's why it's my favorite subject was history. <laughs>
Betty was included in the multitude of people who had someone in the war. Although at the time she didn't know her husband, him and her brother were both a part of the many men who joined up for the service and went overseas at a young age. I think they were around 20, 20, 21. Because my brother graduated in 41. And then it was a short time after that that uh, he went in the service. So my brother was in the Air Force. My husband was, I think, artillery or something, big guns. With her brother at war, Betty, along with many other Americans, wrote letters to the soldiers. Well, they, um, what do you call it, they censored the letters. So no matter what he said that wasn't supposed to be said, it was cut out. But otherwise, he'd tell us where he was, what he'd been doing, and that type of thing. If he said too much, then they'd block it out. A lot of it would be, quite a bit of it would be censored out, maybe a whole paragraph or more. So all we really got was news that he was okay and send more cookies. <laughs> we didn't communicate other, other than letters, but uh, well, we just sent them all the time. I don't know if we ever got all of them, you know, but we kept them going. Mm -hmm. We'd send him care packages, you know, cookies and cigarettes and whatever we could put in. We kept doing that, send him pictures. We'd fix up care packages to send to ones who, you know, they thought didn't have anybody. And we'd send cards to them. And, write letters to somebody's friend, somebody who maybe had a brother in, and we'd switch and write a letter to them. Although writing letters helped keep the hope alive that her brother would come home, Betty also faced heartbreak from the war, such as... When my brother's friend got killed, because we knew him, the families, we knew each other. Yeah, he was a close friend. <clears throat> he was in the Pacific Theater, so we don't know just what happened. Probably a bomb. And then we had stars you put in the window that you had a certain person in the service, and if they got killed, it'd be a gold star. And uh, oh yeah, there were a lot of flags. And, but you knew everybody had it in their window. It was mostly all windows. So. I remember where I was at when the war ended. I was down in State and Madison in Chicago and we couldn't get through. The confetti that came down was unbelievable. We went to the bus station and buses weren't running. They couldn't get through the streets. So we slept in the bus station that night. <laughs> but it was a lot of celebrating going on. Everybody was happy. After the war was over, Americans across the country were thrilled the war ended and their loved ones would finally be coming home. However, for some, they wouldn't get to greet those they had said goodbye to. Oh, I had neighbors and friends and people and boys that I went to school with. Well, I knew a lot of them were gone. A lot of them didn't come back. My brother entered the service with his friend and he was sent, my brother was sent to the European theater his friend went to the Pacific, and he was killed in action. With her brother home, Betty was thrilled, more than thrilled. However, her and many others began to notice things about the soldiers who came home. I think they were traumatized over there. They just, they wanted to forget, but it was in their head. They didn't want to talk about it. So I think it affected them a lot. I remember my husband saying one time that well, when you're down in those trenches, 
bombs are going off overhead, you crawl right into your helmet. Yeah, but he really didn't like to talk about the war when he got home. If you'd ask him questions, he really didn't want to talk about it. Well, he, the only time I know that when he talked about it was when him and my husband got together. We weren't married at that time, though, but uh, he never talked about it, except when he was around my brother, and the two of them found out that they were in the same places at the same time and didn't know each other back when they were over there. So they talked about it themselves, and unless you eavesdropped and listened in, you, you know, I never heard much. My husband didn't want to talk about it at all. What the greatest generation accomplished during World War II will never be forgotten. If Betty learned anything from the war, it would be. Well, I think learn to appreciate what you have, be thankful for it, love one another. <laughs> you never know, your life could be changed overnight. Much faster now than in my day. I would teach a lot of that. Last year, I always heard from Mr. Johnson about our greatest generation and how much they gave for our country. But it wasn't until the gala that I began to truly understand their impact. So I made the decision to take the class and make a documentary. I knew it would take a lot of time and hard work, but I also knew from previous students it would be worth it in the end. But what I didn't expect was how much of an impact it would make on me. And it wasn't until this year that I really understood how great Betty's generation truly is and the sacrifices they gave. From the first moment I listened to her interview, I couldn't wait to get started. And finally getting to meet her was an awesome experience. I had been seeing her through a computer screen every day for so long that it was really cool to finally meet the person whose life you listen to every day. And not only did I get to meet her, but I also had the opportunity to meet her family. It amazes me what she's accomplished, and she gives me hope. Betty, who started as a little girl on a farm and went through a world war, is now a strong woman with children and beautiful grandchildren. Betty's story made me realize that you don't have to be a soldier to be a hero in World War II. Not only did the men at war sacrifice everything they had, but so did those at home. Betty and many others gave up their lives and dedicated it to our country. They persevered and didn't take no for an answer. From working on a farm to working in a factory for the war, Betty dedicated herself to her country and the war. With a generation as distracted and impatient as mine, Betty taught me what it truly means to make a difference. She taught me a new appreciation of life through her stories. I can only hope that through Betty's stories, others will also get the chance to understand what she and many others gave for the ground they walk on. Thank you, Betty, for teaching me how important life is and for giving me the opportunity to make your memories come to life. <laughs>